The Spin-Off Podcast Network. Ready to rediscover the joys of cycling? With over 300 kilometres of cycle paths across Tamaki Makoto, jumping on your bike and going for a ride is such a fun way to discover the city from a different perspective. Cycling is getting more and more popular across Auckland, so now's a great time to join the hype and give cycling a go. Head to at.govt forward slash cycling to find your nearest cycleway today. The Fold is brought to you by O-Media, making brands unmissable and public spaces better across Aotearoa. No mai hoki mai ki the Fold e mihi nei ko Duncan Greve toku ingoa. Uh, my guest today is Courtney Johnston. Uh, she is the Tumu Fukade, the, the chief executive of Te Papa, our, our national museum. Uh, she is also, I, I consider her a friend. We met a few years ago at this kind of weird retreat called, called Flounders Club, which is run by uh, Rowan and Sasha, some friends of mine, and basically got together a bunch of people who were doing hard things and let them spend a weekend kind of collectively agonizing over our our weird jobs together but um i think amongst all of us courtney now certainly has has i think <laughs> the hardest job of all the you know tapapa is something which is trying to tell a big it's trying to do many things and she addresses that but it's it's trying to tell a big collective story about where we've come from who we are and all, in all of the complexities of doing that at any period of time, let alone in 2022. And I think she's just doing quite an extraordinary job of it. And it's because she's just got this like big, super curious, super open brain on her. And I find that whenever I speak to her, I end up very quickly in the weeds of some of the, the kind of big, knotty, fascinating conversations of, of our time. So while it initially feel, felt like a stretch, like, you know, what, what, what are, what are the, what, where does media end and other institutions begin? The fact is that a, a national museum like Te Papa is, is it's a, a focus group of people trying to tell a big, a big story to, to a, a much larger one, ideally to all of us. And, and it felt like, and we discussed this on the podcast, that there is actually quite a lot in common between the role of a museum and the, and the role of media, and furthermore, actually Courtney has you know worked in and around media for much of the last twenty years. Um, whether it's through you know she was an early and avid blogger, she spent ten years being the arts correspondent um, with Catherine Ryan on on Nine to Noon. I was until recently a trustee of the Panagraph Punch, a very good sort of arts and culture website that um, yeah you know, I've, I've written for, and, and um, the spinoff has has uh, good good friendships and relationships with. But more than that, she's worked in and around the, the sort of intersection of these kind of big national institutions like the National Library uh, and art galleries and and th- that culture so the the city gallery and the douse which was her big job that she did a very acclaimed uh, job of uh, prior to starting at Te Papa and it's all of that it's all of that experience you know that you know her life started on, on a farm in Taranaki and and has ended in this like highly scrutinized incredibly complex role but all of that i think has gone into forging her as a person who is kind of near uniquely suited to uh, grappling with all that complexity. And, uh, yeah, so so that, that is the kind of seed of the conversation. It's not a your normal kind of meat and two veg fold where we're, we're talking about the business of this industry, but it's a lot of the threads that are very present uh, in, in our big national discussion of, of who we are and where we've come from and how we atone for some of the things which, you know, the... the the fact that our media institutions have largely been set up to to benefit and to tell the story of a particular group of people, often intentionally not at the expense of another. So that that's that's kind of where we're going. But I think it's a really fun conversation, and I was just so grateful to have have Courtney on the fold. Tenakwe Courtney, and welcome to the fold. Kia ora. Um We've known each other for a little while now, and uh, I've. Every time we we speak, 
it always feels like we're you know, on some level, you know, like we we'll often talk about the media and it, and it feels like we're we're kind of almost doing a podcast. So it's it's quite buzzy to be actually doing it. And yet there's also this thing of like you know, what what is the scope of the fold? Like is is a, is the chief executive of a of a museum part of it? But the more I thought about it, I was like museums feel like on some level the first ever mass mass media. Do, you know, like does that scan for you? Yeah, I think um, I almost think about it from the flip side, which is you know that um, that famous line about how journalism is the first draft of history. So that makes me think that museums are like really slow journalism. You know, like from from that first click response that is a journalist like with a microphone in somebody's face, through to five hundred years later, somebody asking a question about you know a woodcut. <laughs> from the 1560s in London that was talking about whatever was happening in that period. Um, but I do think the two um, disciplines or the two ways through which people encounter each other's stories and experiences and backgrounds are, are interlinked through through curiosity, but also I think because there's, there's just some, for me, very strong resonance between the work and the attitude of journalists, as I've gotten to know journalists better, that I see being reflected in the way that museums and museum people do their work. And especially in the most recently in the last couple of years, as ethics and people's sense of needing to declare their own position, life experience, bias, knowledge, through their storytelling and the positioning of others. And I just think now... Now we're on sort of the same track. Um, and I'd also uh, kind of venture all the way in there and say we are both in the position of changing the public's minds about things, which is a real risky privilege. And that's the, <laughs> we're right in there already. I love it. Um, so because that's, that's you know, something that we, we've talked about and I thought was a really interesting insight was you know, I think journalism has long had this kind of image of itself as uh, you know the sticking it to sticking it to the man and um, you know holding power to account and all that. While at the same time, I think when you look back on it and you know look back on which stories were selected and whose perspective was privileged and the telling of those stories, they were unavoidably quite conservative institutions that, that were sort of breaks on um, society progressing or, or certainly helped entrench the power of, of particular groups at, at various times. And we have, over the past you know, decade or even like five years, being, being real about it, started to kind of have the, that conversation and, and, and fret about that, rightly, as an industry. And, and I remember you saying to me before, like, we've been having that, you know, that, that's obviously something that museums have also done, but you've been worrying about it for a lot longer. Is that fair to say? Oh, worrying about it for ages, ages and ages. Um, there's this, and I don't know if it's true, but it's a story that I love nonetheless, uh, and don't let facts get in the way of a good story, but that um, the British Library uh, apparently discovered it had a huge hole in its collections because they weren't collecting um, romance novels. You know, they were seen as trashy, uh, passing, faddish material for women, bad literature. So they didn't collect them, uh, which means that there's this complete blind spot. Um, and that blind spot, that bias, is something that museums and libraries, we get called the glams, the galleries, libraries, archives and museums. Uh, sometimes people put aquariums and zoos in there, and in America they call it glamazons, which is just, it's very American. <laughs> New Zealanders don't go as far as glamazons. Um, <laughs> But in a joined up way, as um, we sometimes get called memory institutions as well, we operate in the present, telling stories in the present, but always reaching back into the past, which means you're always looking at the past from the perspective of the present. And when you're doing that, you become very, very alive to how your decisions in the present day will be viewed in the future, which is an opportunity to kind of look at your bias live. And I think... One of the fascinating changes I feel like I've seen in the media um, or journalistic practice is I've always thought there's got to be a tension between an editorial process but this idea of objectivity. It's kind of like 
the discrete action of journalism can somehow be objective and then the editorial lens that's applied over it is what states the position. And that idea of being objective is one that museums abandoned decades ago, you know, like um, I'm in my early 40s, so I went through university at the kind of the height of postmodernism and, you know, like Roland Barthes and the death of the author and the, the reader puts all the meaning into the text and there is no one truth. Um, and the great irony there is that by and large the public trusts museums because they think we tell the truth, whereas museum workers have decided there is no such thing <laughs> as the single truth and we Don't all fight against <laughs> that. Well, I think we're trying to say it quite clearly, but um, maybe it's not getting picked up. But I think the the thing, maybe one of the joining points between our practices is um, museums, um, and, and maybe we'll get into uh, the international museum debate later, but um, museums have a practice that we can treat like it was carved into stone tablets and handed down to us on high, you know, like it's um, like the laws of museum practice, you know, like don't touch, put it behind glass, you know, these kind of things. Certainly don't give it back to people. And I feel like a similar thing is happening in journalism as well, where it's understood that its whole practice is a cultural practice and therefore it's coming from a certain background, a certain way of looking at the world and a certain set of values and that that's all kind of disintegrating, which can be highly confusing, really, really fragmenting, but incredibly rich at the same time. It's so much fun to be in. The consequence of it, I think, can be quite discombobulating for people. One thing that's interesting, I think, about you is that, and partly why you know you make sense as a guest on this, is you've actually been in and around the media for a lot of your career prior prior to starting this role from your blogging, which you've just started to, to doing again. So, so retro, it, it is. But and I was like looking at the, you know, so it's a blog spot, and it looks like hell, but it also, you know, nostalgia. It gets you, you know, because it it, it has that sort of. You know, it, it looks like a very specific and um, evocative kind of hell. Um, <laughs> but also, you know, you've been arts correspondent on, on Nine to Noon for the thick end of a, of a decade, uh, work, worked in comms and, and so on. How do you think that that has sort of impacted your work and what, what, what part of that have you brought to, to, to the role of, of Te Papa, of, of CEO of Te Papa? I think if I'd um, known about journalism at high school, that's what I would have done, you know. And I'm, I'm in, I am in the job of my lifetime, and I fucking love it. Um, but I do sometimes think about what comes next, and I would love to go back to making something with my hands, uh, which for me is writing. And you know, there, there's a big chunk of me that uh, thinks, and there's a beautiful irony to this, but uh, I'd really actually love to, at the end of this job, retrain in journalism and see if I can have a crack at it as kind of like a mature student <laughs> in the industry. We but, would welcome um, you. If there is still a <laughs> journalism being practiced at the end of your... We haven't all turned into museums <laughs> at that point. Um, but, yeah, I think, yeah, I, I, didn't, um, I didn't grow up in a family that talked about the media. I didn't grow up in a family that went to museums either, for that matter, but... Um, if I'd known about journalism, because I guess it's to, like I love interviewing people for jobs just because I'm nosy, you know, and, and journalism just seems like this amazing opportunity to be nosy about stuff for the public good. Um, but yeah, I have, I'm a failed curator. That was one of the other like uh, turning points in, in my my infant career, I um, had like a, a, while I was working on my master's, I was working at City Gallery and Civic Square in Wellington, Contemporary Art Gallery. And uh, uh, there were two of us doing the same sort of assistant role and two jobs came up, one for a proper assistant curator and one for the PR person. And uh, the person who's not me got to become a curator and now they are a very senior, respected curator in a New Zealand institution and uh, I got to dabble in PR instead. And I can remember sitting at my desk at City Gallery and this would have been for uh, 2004, 2005 and uh, I was reading Jezebel 
um, do you remember Jezebel? Oh, yeah. And Gorka Media and all those kind of things? Yeah, absolutely. Um, And it introduced me to this whole new way, you know, because I'd come out of art history at university and and, and I go back to my my master's thesis and it's just so florid and turgid and uh, and I'm trying so hard, like you are when you're 22. (laughs) Absolutely. Um, But web writing, like clicking into that new kind of like chatty, highly personalised way of writing, uh, just showed me a different way of taking something that you care about and getting it to an audience. And I think that's what, that was that was just it. And so I was really lucky not to get to be what I wanted to be because it meant I got to be a whole bunch of other things. Um, in the background, uh, my first marriage, uh, my first husband was a curator of New Zealand art and uh, as such, there were like three jobs in New Zealand that he was interested in and, and he was a lot older than me and a lot more established than I was. And so, you know, and I look back on this and it's and it's the anti-advice that I wouldn't give young people today. Um, but I shaped my career so that we wouldn't be in competition, so that I would be a generalist, uh, so that if we moved for his job, I'd be able to pick up work easily. All those kind of uh things. So, you know, reading Jezebel, and then I got the pip with the gallery. I thought I hated galleries. I swore I was never going to work <laughs> in them again, but it turned out I just didn't like the current management style uh, at the gallery, and those are two very different things. Uh, so I went to National Library in a comms role, and uh, didn't know how to do comms, but apparently that doesn't matter when you're in your early 20s. They just need bodies, right? And uh, But then I saw the web team, and I saw that they were doing this, like, magical new stuff and I actually started blogging in 2006 and just the most like earnest is a hallmark of my personality I cannot deny that but in the most earnest way where I set myself this target of learning something about the internet every day and blogging about what I'd learned like whether it was alt text or whatever like so nerdy Duncan um (laughs) And then it kind of it, burgeoned over into, you know, the things that I was really interested in, which was the visual arts and the visual arts community and, and artists and, and the debates that surround all of these kind of things about, you know, the markets and representation and, and all that sort of stuff. Um, so I skated my way into the web team there, I got into information architecture and user experience design, and it was the dawn of agile project management, and it was... The period of web stock in Wellington, which was this um, Mike Brown and Tasha Lampard, this hugely influential industry conference that was like, I have modelled so many gatherings on the care that they put into that experience. And they brought these just like fucking legends of the internet to Wellington. And so like the founders of Flickr or George Oates from Flickr and talking about community management, you know, all of these things. So all of these things, radical transparency, opening the kimono, whatever else we said at that time, you know, all those terrible, terrible (laughs) phrases. Terrible. (laughs) Um, But, you know, it came at me when I was in my my late 20s and it just completely changed my perspective. So I think I'm still probably... I'm still the only museum director that I've met who comes from a digital background, not even a comms background, not an educator background, but a a digital background. And I think it has radically changed the way that I approach doing this job. And, And a lot of it was, it was a combination of the ethics that I encountered at National Library while I was doing this work, and then that optimism of Web 2.0. Um, and there was this thing that Tim O'Reilly said. Uh, Tim O'Reilly's a, a, he was a publisher of like internet sites, self-educating books and conferences and things like that. But he, he's an, an activist and a renaissance man and all of those things. But he talked about, he went to a Twitter boot camp in like 2008 and he talked about creating more value than you capture. And I think I've always taken that on as a way of doing my work and as I've got into positions of of more power and influence, I've continued that, you know, it's not about being brand first, it's about being audience first, it's not your logo, it's the change, it's um, 
you are going to do well, but how well can those around you do by virtue of your work? Create more value uh, for others than you capture for yourself. And um, I think, you know, I'm a, I'm a little, I guess, nostalgic now for that time and a little mournful that the internet of today uh, I, sometimes I feel like I'm the only person who's still having a nice time on Twitter. <laughs> like, for the very first time the other day, I tweeted um, this article about Lizanne McGregor, an Australian art gallery director who'd retired, and she'd kind of finally come out about just the horrific misogyny she had faced from the political system over there. And it was uh, uh, the first time that someone came at me on Twitter, Twitter and called me a, a sooky C-word. And uh, no one's ever done that before. Like, I feel like the last woman on Twitter to be called a cunt s- somehow. So I still have a lovely experience uh, of the internet, but I do mourn the optimism of that period. But but it changed the way I do my work dramatically. It feels like there's a lot of um, you know, increasingly intense nostalgia for the for the optimism, for the openness, the, the sense of what... Yeah, you know, of a, of, a, of an imagined future that never did come to be um, around at the moment, and also like you know, you even see in things like Web three a, a desire to a completely unrealised as yet to to try and build something that that more properly uh, represents uh, that that future. So you bring that all that into this this role, um, and you know you're you're part of that small group of. Of chief execs who basically just landed in a new role and then then the world expo- explodes. How how are you going? Like it's it's a, a super unchill job at the best of times, uh, and you did it at, at this completely uh, mad period of time. And and you're kind of starting to you know get your head around what what the the job is. Like how how is it? Is it all tracking? <laughs> How's it going? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I am. Um, I'm one of those COVID CEs, uh, like. Cam Harland. Um, you know, I was in the job for three months uh, before we shut the doors and we went into went into a you know international lockdown and and the world changed and you know your um, your monopod you in your wardrobe with your blanket over your head talking about you know the 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 you know the coming death of the media effectively is actually one of my strongest memories of that first <laughs> lockdown just the utter kind of despair and desperation but your need to bear witness to that moment um, which again resonates with the work that I do bearing witness is uh, a role that we play and we bear witness to other people's experience but it was it was really fucking hard Yeah, it was really, really hard. I was a completely untested CE. I had been appointed by a board in a very, very stable point to, um, you know, it was a massive jump up for me. Um, If the board had known what was coming, I think they would have picked a really different person. Safer hands. Much safer safer pair of hands. hands, Oh, my God. But everything looked rosy at that point, so why not change direction Appoint a New Zealander, God forbid. Imagine. Um, <laughs> imagine, imagine that. Um, you know, uh, it, 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 was re- it was really, really fucking hard. Um, I think the, the silver lining of it for us specifically at Te Papa, after a decade of, of turmoil, of crushing restructures, of just, you know, rock bottom morale, it just our, our first job became to care for our people you know, like all employers. And and that was amazing. Um, and it was exhausting. I think we all went through that that almost international react, first reaction to, to the pandemic, which was uh, we need to invent a better world on the other side of this. So we all went smashing into innovation and overproduction and then it all stretched out. And then we were still trying to stay true to that goal that we'd set ourselves and found ourselves in, you know, the second year of just coping and all that creative energy that we normally bring to our jobs and our lives is just drained by the need to keep coping with change, you know, and coping with change is very different from opting for change. I feel like as a as a um, community and a culture and a workforce after nearly, what is it now, two and a bit years, I, I think we're... It's beginning to feel good again, you know, and, and Matariki couldn't have come at a more amazing time. Um, 
in so many different ways, but I think as well it has felt like a, a shift back to, to opening up. And for myself, I can feel that I've come out of that, um, that thrashing, um, that self-doubt, that incredible self-scrutiny of, of the first two years of being in this role. And now, now I feel like I'm going to be able to get started on doing the job that I actually thought I was going to be doing. We've written out a few other um, uh, problems and crises along that time, alongside the pandemic as well. And none of them, none of them, you know, are, um, none of them are glory topics, but we're better off as a result. Um, the analogy I, I use, we were talking about sport earlier, is um, I do Brazilian jiu-jitsu. And I stopped, um, I, I stopped for about a year and a half over the time of the pandemic, but also because uh, I had a wrist injury that kept on popping up. Um, I'd become a stepmother and I was adjusting to this new form of life where you can't just be selfish with your time uh, like I'd been used to for 40 something uh, years, but also because jujitsu is a really intimate sport. You do everything with another person. And, and at the end of the day at work, I just couldn't face having another person literally in my face <laughs> talking <laughs> at me. And because I'm a senior belt, I do help coach people a lot. So I'd be, it, it was just too much work, but I've gone back Recently, and I was there one night in a beginner's class, and I looked at these two guys on the mat next to me, brand new, straight off the street, you know. Um, I bet they're totally into the UFC, and they listen to the Joe Rogan podcast, you know. They're those guys. And they're just the biggest, most beautiful munters. <laughs> and um, and they're, like, like jiu-jitsu, it requires you to be in this, you know, it's very martial arts. You know, like, you need to be uh, strong enough to make it work, and fluid enough to make it work at the same time. And these two guys are just going balls to the fucking wall, you know? Like, they're going, everything's 200%, and they're throwing each other around the mat. Nothing works because they're so rigid, and they're so hyper-activated because they feel like they're being assaulted, uh, which they're not. Like, it's basically the beginner's classes are like yoga with another person. But when you're fresh to it, it's just so overwhelming, you've got your face and someone else's groin and someone's yelling at you to move your right hand in a different kind of way and you've forgotten any sense of direction. And I was just like, fuck, that's what it feels like being a first time CE. Or the first time you get dropped into anything, you know, like you're you're overwhelmed, you're overstimulated, nothing feels natural, you've got no context to put what you're learning into, you, you almost can't hear what people are saying to try to help you because you're just so overwhelmed. And I kind of sat back and I went, fuck, I'm not a white belt anymore. You know, like some days I am, I do I do, do some white belt stuff and I sit there and I go, whoa, that was a white belt moment. Um, but in a jujitsu scale, I'd say most days now I'm cruising along at kind of purple, which is where you've got enough knowledge and experience and mastery and you've, you've, uh, you can tell the difference between pain, which is will pass and you can manage, and injury, which is a bad thing that you should avoid. Um, and you're, you're not just thinking about yourself, you're actually thinking now about your impact on your partner and the other people around you. And so it's a very refreshing place to be, feeling like a, a purple belt CE most days, you know, still, still a lot to learn. And I know I'll get a lot better over time because we always do. Um, but, but yeah, to have that white belt COVID pandemic period behind me feels really good. <laughs> Glad you're through the pure, pure terror <laughs> of it. The Fold is brought to you by O-Media, making brands unmissable and public spaces better across Aotearoa, with over 4,000 out-of-home advertising sites nationwide across both street furniture and retail centres. I'm super grateful to O-Media for enabling us to make unmissable connections with Kiwis. K-pop to me means more than just listening to music. It's learning to be myself. The spin-off's new documentary, k Polys follows three Pacific youth obsessed with K-pop. In a one-off documentary, see what they've found in Korean pop culture and how they bridge it with their own. When you start dressing, looking different, everyone side-eyes you. But in K-pop, they're just like, no, like celebrate yourself. 
Watch K Polys today at thespinoff.co.nz slash videos. Made with the support of New Zealand on here. Talo for lover. I'm Madeline Chapman, editor at The Spin-Off. If you have the means, consider supporting our high quality journalism by becoming a spin-off member. Sign up now at thespinoff.co.nz slash donate. It's interesting, right? Because you know you're, you're, we're, we're the same age, both both forty two on the button, and we're talking before we came on about that sense of being kind of midway between a sort of a firebrand younger generation and a um, an older generation that kind of you know per, per, perhaps because of you know the, the whether it's the length of time they've been in their roles is sort of potentially resistant to to some of that um, that pace of of change and and sort of. Finding that by by virtue of of age and experience that you sort of have a lot of sympathy for both perspectives, and even though they feel on some level unresolvable, do you that that must on also be a kind of a microcosm of what you deal with as a museum, and that you must have staff who came out of earlier generations of practice and kind of have a lot of veneration for those ideas of. of a preservation and um, and particular ways of looking at things, and also you have to serve these these audiences, which probably now more, if not more than ever, but certainly um, as of right now, can have quite wildly differing ideas of what the function of your institution is and what they want to get out of it. But they all go into the same space, and there's something beautiful about that. But there must be times when it feels unresolvable, or, or anyway, how do you, how do you navigate all that? Spend a lot of time uh, looking around the table and thinking to myself, everyone here is right. <laughs> everyone is right, but we can only choose one pathway. Um, or we can only make one decision at this time. I had this really uh, transformative experience early in my career when I was working at the the National Library, and the National Library is a, a um, it's a combined beast, bless it. It's got the Alexander Turnbull Library inside of it. So it's a separately constituted library, uh, which is the, the Heritage Library. And it sits inside the National Library, which was created uh, quite a lot later, like 80 years later in the 1960s, I think. And inside the Alexander Turnbull Library is Legans, the Lesbian and Gay Archive of New Zealand. And it's largely oral history recordings. Um, and it's got a very, very small, dedicated staffing. And when I was at the library, I was in my late 20s and I was in full firebrand, you know, and it was it was like 2007, 2008, and it was the dawn of Web 2.0 and it was all the old things that didn't have vowels in them, like Flickr, you know, and it was all new and exciting and um, like we were using Bebo to talk to musicians about doing... Uh, following their legislative responsibilities to deposit <laughs> copies of their recordings with the National Library, as they're meant to. Um, but it was all new and fresh, and we were just, like, fired up by the possibilities of this new democratic internet. Um, it was such a golden age, and we didn't realise what we were in. Um, and so I was quite righteous at that stage, you know, and I was in my early 20s, and I thought I was figuring it out for the first time. So I assumed, as one sometimes does that uh, clearly no one else knew anything. And I can remember going into these um, going into these meetings with much older members of staff, you know, people in their uh, 50s, 60s, sometimes even 70s, some of whom had spent their whole careers building up these collections and me just like railing against the greyheads um, who I thought were resistant to change and uh, standing in the way of this amazing new opportunity for us to reach new audiences with all this content that had been locked up for all of this time. And uh, as I got a bit older and smarter and um, sort of turned my mouth off and turned my ears on, I realised, particularly with this archive, the Lesbian and Gay Archive of New Zealand, what had gone into the making of those recordings, the, the life experiences of people who had been gay before homosexual law reform, the incredible danger, the repression, the rejection from their family, the assault, the, the legal risk, the, the things that would happen to them and they couldn't go to the police because of it, and the, the incredible care that these protectors and curators, the word curator comes from the Latin to care, uh, that these curators were putting into these collections because the collections are people. You know, it might be a it might be an audio recording, but that's 
a person. And uh, it, A, it gave me that understanding that uh, even old people were activists in their <laughs> time and some of the fights that they were fighting were so much bigger than the one that I thought I was on. Mm. Um, but also gave me this understanding that there are, when, when it comes to the work that, that I do and my colleagues do, that there are different forms of activism um, activism and, and protectionism. And sometimes protecting is a form of activism in an odd kind of way. Um, that's the conversation. I, again, I came from, um, came of age during the great dawn of like open access. And there was a massive move towards open access and government in the sort of 2010s that I was part of, which gave me this really one-eyed idea about everything belongs on the internet, which is where everyone can access it, and that's how we get the most possible benefit from the incredible knowledge and richness of these collections, or, or basically of anything in the world. You know, and track forward to today, and um, that's the argument that the British Museum uses for not repatriating stolen and looted objects in their collection. Like, they quite... Uh, quite openly say the Parthenon marbles, for example, uh, in the interests of universal knowledge, it's better that those marbles be somewhere where people can easily access them, which happens to be in their museum in London. Not in Athens, where <laughs> they belong, but in their museum in London, where they can share them with people universally. And uh, so for me, one of my biggest learning experiences has been thinking about collections and access from a Māori perspective and a applying mātauranga Māori and tikanga to that and thinking about how you control or protect access or open up access in a much more measured and considered way through a value system that's not the one that I was brought up in. Um, and I love my work. I love my work because these are the kind of quality of conversations that we get to have, you know, the, um, the public experiences. Like, it's almost, I think of it, as like the icing on the cake of the work that we do. But same as the editorial process, I imagine. It's the, the behind-the-scenes discussions and decisions that never uh, explicitly reach the audience that are the things that move us forward and are so fascinating to be part of. So obviously, Te Papa is, is many different things, but I sort of wanted to hear it from you. Like, explain, explain what it is, where it came from uh, for our listeners. Um, Te Papa opened in 1998 on the waterfront uh, in Wellington. The, the, uh, the, the foundations were literally like hammered into place for this new, new big building. And lying behind that, there were um, forces of change. New Zealand, I think, is the only country in the OECD to have dissolved a uh, separate National Art Gallery, National Museum, and brought them together into a single uh, institution, which, you know, uh, for my people is massive. Uh, for most people is probably not a big deal. But Te Papa was created as a deliberate disruption. Uh, it came out of all of that social change of the 70s and 80s, things like homosexual law reform, but the establishment of the Waitangi Tribunal, uh, the recognition of Te Reo Māori as an official language, the establishment of Kohanga Reo, um, all of those moves, pay parity for women, you know, it was such a, such a fast-moving, fast-changing, progressive period. And the, the dusty old museum, which had outgrown its physical premises, uh, wasn't up to scratch anymore. But one of the most pivotal moments was the Te Māori exhibition, which was an ex exhibition of Taonga Māori that went to the United States uh, in 1984, opened at the Metropolitan and came back to New Zealand, went to all the major centres. It was the first exhibition ever, really, uh, certainly international exhibition, where, where Māori got to control their story and their taonga and their tikanga and their practice around its presentation for the first time instead of being on the outside looking in on, you know, frankly, largely Pākehā people who had decided that they were experts on a culture, uh, that Māori were in control. And then on the other side of it, there was a, 
what we call the new museology, which uh, in the, the many ages of museums, they start off in the kind of the 1500s as gentlemen's collections of curiosities. Like, do you want to come around and see my transformers? I've got awesome transformers. <laughs> but curiosities from around the world. And then moving through to kind of like the Victoria and Albert idea of, you know, the educational space largely for the working man. And then one day we'll let women in too. That'll be awesome. Uh, nah, post-World War II, it's all about... Um, I guess recovering from the tragedy of war by opening up education and the arts and culture to everybody, that um, that kind of democratic access in a way could help heal a damaged world. And then in the 80s, the new museology was the next shift on from that again. And and I always think of it as it it shifted the burden of meaning making or the privilege of meaning making that maybe museums in the past had looked at visitors as almost like empty vessels who work at, walk into a museum and then you like top them up with good information and then they leave the museum as smarter, better members of society. The flip was understanding, hey, maybe people want to have fun in a museum. Maybe they want to like touch something or do something. Um, and that was the beginning of interactivity. But also the idea that anyone who walks into the museum might be more of an expert in something than anyone who works inside of the museum. So this massive shift in the sharing of power. So all of these things bind up into the dissolution of the National Art Gallery and National Museum that were, and the creation of the 1992 legislation that leads to the creation of Te Papa, and then the opening of Te Papa in 1998, which um, many uh, museum professionals, and particularly the arts, the visual arts sector, just deplored, hated it, hated it. Well, um, why did they hate it? Oh, my God. We put a, um, we put a, like, I wasn't there. <laughs> I was at high school in New Plymouth at this point. So this is all hearsay, but it's also documented hearsay. I hated it. Um, there were thumbs up, thumbs down signs in the art gallery that invited, like like Twitter, before we had it. Amazing. Uh, they put a McCann next to a Calvinator fridge to talk about what was happening in society at that point in time. Uh, one of the bits of feedback that gets less commented on, there has always been a display dedicated to Mori Ore, at to Papa. Uh, and when the museum opened, uh, like actual proper historians came to us and said, uh, they're an extinct culture. Why are you presenting them like they're alive? I know, I know, it's gobsmacking. It was, Te Papa was interactive. It had paid for theme rides down in a thing called Time Warp. Uh, the cafe had a name. It was the food train. It was um, like the mall meets the museum, wrapped up in uh, Kiwiana, but with a deep underpinning of, I guess today what we're aiming for is tino ranga teratanga, you know? All of this change uh, wrapped up together into this one place um, that was designed to be a new expression of national identity of what a 20th, 21st century New Zealand would look like. The, you know, there seems to me, even as you're talking, there's a real kind of lightness and excitement about that. And, you know, there's a sort of this dusty image of a, the museum in your head that is very sort of quiet and scholarly and creeping around. And, you know, especially in this era, you know, everyone is screaming for attention all the time and you can't, you know, like, not that that was ever the right way of going about things, but it was like a society wide way of comporting itself. And you can see why people would find that very confronting. But now looking back, that actually feels strikingly innovative. You know, like in terms of that, that spirit, do you feel like it's still in the museum, this idea that it it should be in motion and should be kind of con- confronting it? It, so it feels like it, it, it must be. And that, that's a very positive thing overall for the way that it relates to the society it serves. Uh, so I spend a lot of time looking at our legislation, which is quite weird, but um, it, it's quite handy to have something like that that's sort of uh, is a bedrock for you. And uh, I counted the sections the other day, uh, and there's 33 sections, right? And about about a third of them are just process that undo the past and create a next one. And, and another big chunk of it is just about the responsibilities of the board because we're a crown entity. So we're both a museum and a crown entity, which is a, sort of a strange shifting ground to occupy occasionally. Uh, there's a, a preamble up the front with quite a lot of throat clearing in it. And then there are, of the 33 sections, there are three that actually tell us what we're there to do and how we're meant to do it. Um, the, the functions of the board of Te Papa, which are to, you know, 
do the things, uh, make the collections, make them accessible, keep them safe, provide an education service, support other museums uh, in the country, loan things so that other people can work with them, do research, stuff like that. And then there's a section about how we're there to do it, um, having regard for, I think the wording is, Māori, European and other cultures, um, and then to be a source of pride for all New Zealanders, which, oh my God, it's such a dodgy line. Um, that feels completely unachievable, uh, but, but also cute. Cute. <laughs> Aspirational. Um, what I use that line for myself is uh, I do occasionally when I've got a really hard decision in front of me, I test myself on that line. Um, and I don't, I try, I try so hard not to think about New Zealand today. I try to think about New Zealand in 20 years and what would a 25 year old in 20 years time think of the decision that I'm making today. And maybe that's the skill that you build up working in museums, is you get so used to thinking about posterity, you start sort of forecasting the impact of your work by looking at the previous impacts, all the shit-ass things that museums did in the past that we're atoning for now and trying to make right, you kind of go, you know, there but for the grace of God go I, you know, like how, so I try to forecast myself to test these things. The legislation doesn't say anything about a whole bunch of stuff that has been baked into Te Papa as a culture and as a community, and I guess as a as a kind of reflection of Aotearoa New Zealand. So it doesn't actually mention the treaty, um, unlike other pieces of legislation from the 1990s, doesn't mention the treaty, uh, doesn't mention biculturalism, which has been kind of a, a founding principle of Te Papa since we opened, uh, doesn't... Uh, mentioned co-leadership. So Te Papa is the only uh, part of the public sector, I guess, the only um, organisation in the public sector that has had a co-leadership arrangement with the chief executive and a kaihotu since it's opened in 1998, not in the legislation, not enabled by the public service. We just kind of gym crack it all the time by putting two signatures onto all the official documents. It's like... Um, I compare it to letting a tree grow up through the concrete. You know, you just kind of find the cracks and you grow through them. Uh, Te Papa also went from the old museum, which I think was pretty much fully publicly funded, to needing to generate nearly 50% of the revenue that it operated on. Um, we still have one of the highest kind of in New Zealand margins of, of earned revenue um, in addition to the crown funding that we receive. And so... Uh, one of Te Papa's opening principles was commercially positive. Uh, very neoliberal when you look back <laughs> on it. Like, it completely makes sense. It's kind of like, yes, you can have the cake, but you have to earn it. Um, and, yeah, all of these things kind of came together and made this new museum. And so we do spend, like, as a, a young community, we do spend rather a lot of time kind of, like, picking over our past, um, but also learning from it and then trying to decide how to take it into the future. And it is all about those those value judgments. But underpinning it all, I think, is this... Um, I did this experiment once at a, a museum conference, I think, and I was in this room of about 30 people and they were talking about something and I was feeling like the real odd one out. And I, I just said to everyone, I was like, hands up who had a horrible time at high school. And almost everyone in the room put up their hand, <laughs> whereas I loved high school. It was like one of the most successful periods of my life. But museums and libraries and galleries, they're often people who are totally on the side of the underdog, you know, the, um, the people who didn't fit in, the people who have been ignored, the people who have been misrepresented, the people who have been silenced. It's, um, it's such an important, it is such a big value set inside of the people I work with. With you go to a museum conference, and that's pretty much the whole track. Um, and it can make working in these institutions really, really hard on people because often you are working in a trauma area, but it's where the reward is as well. And again, I guess if I kind of circle back to the point and like the the how how can we draw some kind of you know bridge between. Um, the things that we do. Again, I feel like this is a place where journalists are much 
more willing to enter into now and are being explicitly encouraged. Like I look at what Sinead and Anna Fifield are doing at stuff and they, they are explicitly encouraging this, but they're also having to deal with how does an audience respond. When your work begins to look like activism, whereas it has always been activism, it was just invisible to most people because they are the dominant mainstream and therefore the activism was in their interests and they were just swimming in it like water. Yeah, I, mean, I think that, that that's a very good way of putting it. I mean, but I actually think that, you know, and th- that tension is a, while it's a, a really difficult one to navigate, I, you know, and that's where Te Papa, because it has that, you know, it has to earn its keep or, or some of it, it... Um, yeah, you know, probably has more in common with an institution like staff, or, or indeed the spin-off, than it does with some other parts of the crown, which basically just get to be and, you know, not to get too sort of neoliberal critique on it. But if you're a monopoly supplier of a thing, you're you're you don't feel your success or failure in the same way that you do when it's really about can can you go and find an audience. That tension between you know you have all these. Uh, you know, often invisible elements of the work you do, even down to the re- repatriation of um, bodies, of we've, as we've talked about before, or, or preserving these giant collections of, um, you know, various flora and fauna. And at the same time, you have to be popular. And some of the people who are coming the, jo- the door, and very, probably quite a big percentage of them, just want to go and look at your curiosities, don't necessarily want to get into the, the big kind of postmodern, postcolonial tra- trauma thing. Like how, how do you manage that? And like, is that, is that a weight or is it actually, or can it be liberating? I think it's both. I mean, I think all these things are both. I think I've, um, as I age, I think I've given myself the, uh, the comfort of not having a definitive answer to any one thing anymore. But um, I guess... If let's take Te Taiao as an example, it's the uh, the refurb of our natural history experience um, on level two. So it's one of the most visited parts of the museum, and it's uh, got two things that people are deeply attached to: the the giant squid, which was the big area of concern. You're going to take the giant squid off display, and the earthquake house. And uh, Henry Cook, late of the st- of stuff. Um, the reason I got to know him was because he had grown up with the old earthquake house and he was so upset when he saw the new one because it wasn't the earthquake house of his childhood, you know? And Henry is all of, what, 26, 27? He, like. might, he, might, he might be 30 now, but, but, but probably not even that, actually. You're right. And so this Young is, to be a conservative. <laughs> but we're all... Um, that nostalgia for our own childhoods kind of, I think, hits us in our 20s. Like, it's surprising how quickly we develop nostalgia in ourselves. And uh, even if we're in a very progressive phase of our lives, sometimes still don't want things to change. And I think that's one of the things that museums are constantly tackling is because, um, you know, a, a news outlet puts a story on the front page and it's on the front page for a day and it might be, you know, fish and ship wrapper the next week, or it might be something that in 50 years' time is still deeply, deeply relevant. You can't tell when you're, when you're doing it. Um, museums work slower. The things that we put out there last for longer, which gives people a chance to get very, very attached to them and not always seek change. So some of the, sometimes the worst thing a museum can do is take something that was very, very loved and then update it to meet the needs of a new audience new social expectations, new research, but you take away something that people had become attached to and there will be backlash um, because we very rarely hear the backlash from the people who were excluded. So it's the, the overserved who tell you that they're now feeling less served and uh, they're angry about that. That's something we have to deal with. But like te taiao, so once we got past, the, the squid's still there, and I'm sorry, but yes, the earthquake house has changed. Um, and it's full of these, like, beautiful, um, beautiful interactive things. Like, you can sniff a kakapo, you can weigh yourself against a moa. Um, you, yeah, all these things that you can do. But it, it leads you, because it is a storytelling device along a pathway. And that pathway is designed very explicitly um, to help you fall in love with this unique environment 
that we're part of and to understand that it's changing all the time. To understand the fragility of that environment, all of the threats, whether they're, you know, geotechnical or introduced pests. And then to ask you as you exit, what action are you going to take? Do you know, as a person of this country or a visitor to this country, what are you going to do to make this better? And this is probably my big internal tension working in these places is that um, museums are seen as neutral by and large by the public and we're trusted for that neutrality, you know, and and, and this does my head in the, the media uh, falling trust levels. Plummeting, absolutely. <laughs> Plummeting, just going through the floor. It must be horrific for you all. <laughs> it's um, not ideal. <laughs> and and then, then museums, I guess because we are seen as so innocuous, um, are highly, highly trusted, whereas I think we've been directing people's attitudes ever since we started um, and for the last few decades in a, in a deeply progressive manner. Like I spend far less time... Uh, thinking about, am I scared to put this on the floor, um, as opposed to, no, nah, that's been done, that's mainstream, enough old white men, we've been there, that's had its day. Um, it's almost um, it's almost about well, how far can you keep on pushing it, and, and by and large, and maybe I'm so lucky to work with such talented storytellers, such amazing researchers, and such incredible collaboration that... Um, even though the risk can sometimes feel really high internally, it, it is almost always well received by an audience. And the backlash that we do get, the that's not my New Zealand history, I will get, gladly receive that because that is kind of one of those <sighs> indicators that you're still pushing something forward. And if there are people who are still hanging on by their fingertips to an outdated picture of what this country is, then... If they're the people who I'm disappointing, I'm okay with that. Kelda Courtney, that was so, so fun. It was everything I, I hoped it would be, even though at the same time I feel like we could talk for three or four more hours, and no, no doubt we will. But, yeah, thank you so much for coming up to The Fold. Oh, uh, honestly, Duncan, like, lifelong dream. <laughs> so happy to be here. <laughs> Weird dream, but okay. The Fold was brought to you by the Spin-Off Podcast Network, together with Daylight. It was hosted by Duncan Grieve. Produced by T.I. Hair Butler, with production management by Rachel LaRue and series production by Jane Yee. That was The Fold, brought to you by our partners at O Media, making brands unmissable and public spaces better across Aotearoa. Huge thanks to O Media for sponsoring this episode of The Fold and enabling us to make unmissable connections with Kiwis. Kia ora e te iwi, te Ahe Butler here, podcast manager at The Spin-Off. If you enjoy listening to our podcasts, consider supporting our mahi by signing up to become a Spin-Off member at thespinoff.co.nz slash donate. The Spin-Off Podcast Network.